Thank you, Don. It's a pleasure to be here today, guys uh, and girls. I will ostensibly be covering three things, the why, the what, and the how to get loops, ha, loops to work for you and to share with you some of my experiences on using loops in the last six or seven months. I have been using loops for about five years, but in the last year I decided to actually document and track the performance of the loops in a meaningful manner. So roughly speaking, we've got three quarters of an hour. I will try structure so that we've got five minutes at the end uh, for questions and answers, but if I'm unsuccessful, we'll go on afterwards into the tea break or you can reach out to me by my email. So, who am I? So I've been involved in amateur radio and in electronics for about 30 odd years. Based on my accent, you can hear that I grew up uh, in South Africa, although I've been outside the country for more than 25 years, so it's probably watered down a little bit. I've been enjoying radio and electronics for quite some time, from starting with sticking screwdrivers into plug sockets and being amazed by the volts that jolt, and then understanding that there were radio waves. And that's thing what got me involved in radio, and then family work, moving between countries, I had to take a break from radio. But my interests over the years have included working with Arduinos, and more recently ESP32s. I do an awful lot of home automation, so all my power and lighting circuits at home are controllable by my phone. I've got power utilization of washing machines and dishwashers. You know, the other, other half used to want to know, how did I know she did three loads of laundry? Was I spying on her? But I could just see the power spikes. To uh, tracking the temperature, the temperature decay in the house, and so on. So I really do like the idea of interfacing the environment with computers and obviously radio, the ability when using something like a magnetic loop which uses a variable capacitor, something like that which we'll go into a bit later, being able to turn that with a stepper motor driven by an Arduino which is plugged into my radio tickles my interest in electronics, radio and antennas. So you can imagine I've had a lot of fun over the years building automagic tuners for loops which we'll get into a little bit later in the talk. I work unsurprisingly in the IT industry. And uh, today's talk is going to cover uh, the broadly, the why, the what, and the how, as I've mentioned, on constructing loops. I'm not going to get into the debate of do loops work and how do they work. I'm going to show you that they work, and then I'll let you draw your own conclusions as to how well they work. I will not be going into theory in any unnecessary levels of detail other than pointing you at some websites which will help you with calculating sizes of loops and I will share some of the formulas for them but in 45 minutes there's only so much time that I have to go through some of that theory. That and I'm sure some of you probably know more about the theory than I do. One of the things I started out doing is using Whisper to see how well my loops and my antennas were working. And I'll touch on Whisper a little bit later. But the thing with Whisper is it's one directional. You send out a broadcast, somebody records it, puts it onto a website. I needed a way to find out, so you heard me at this signal strength, what did I hear you at? And FT8 became quite an interesting way for me to track both sides of the conversation, if you will. Because at the end of the day, when living in, a, in an RF unfriendly environment, i.e. England, in a residential estate with ADSL and plasma TVs and various other things, there's a lot of hash that's being spewed by these LEDs and wall warts and whatnot. So understanding your relative received performance was just as important as your transmit performance. So I also will be going into what I've done to create a virtual antenna system that spans 10 through 160 meters that tracks the VFO of my radio. So I don't have to run out the garden every five minutes to retune the loop. Because those of you who are familiar with loops, they're high Q, you need to keep retuning them. So that's quite an important thing. Now there's a disclaimer here in that any commercial products that I've referenced comes with no endorsement. I get no commercial benefit from them. I can't even guarantee that they're going to work. If I've stated that they work, then they've worked for me and your mileage might vary. Other than that, if I have referenced something that is missing a source reference, please let me know, because not all of this is unique thought. In fact, pretty much all of it is not unique thought. So, why did I look at loops? Well, I moved to a new QTH, and I wanted to operate on all of the HF bands. Simple enough request, put up a wire antenna, and realized my backyard wasn't very large to support an 80-meter or 160-meter antenna at 
ideally 80 or 100 meters above the ground. So I had insufficient space height to support the dimensions of the antennas that I wanted to have. And as I mentioned, the, the sheer amount of QRM that I had in my QTH, at times it was you know, S9 plus 10, which made operating on 80 or 160 unfriendly. When looking at loops, they tend to be less sensitive to picking up electrical noise in the near field. In other words, less than one wavelength. Why is that important? Because if you're living in one of the modern residential estates, within 160 meters or 80 meters, you've got an awful lot of neighbors with awful lot of electrical devices and ADSL and plasma TVs, et cetera, in their homes, which are likely to be kicking out interference. I also wanted something with a little bit of radiation uh, directivity. And I wanted something I could potentially use with a small TV antenna rotator. Because there was no point in me setting up an antenna system if I had spent an awful lot of money on rotators and all that kind of stuff. So I wanted something inexpensive to get going. I also wanted something with sharp nulls, which could then cancel out anything in the near field with a strong uh, interference source. So I have some neighbors who've got some rather cheap inverters for their solar panels. So what I, what I can do to deal with that. And in addition to RF interference, I needed to deal with neighbor interference. And if you know what I mean by putting up an antenna and the neighbor's getting upset and notifying the council. So as Don mentioned, uh, my kids and certainly my neighbors seem to think of my loops as garden art. And some of my neighbors think I'm actually making electricity. So that has worked well for me. So certainly a lot more inconspicuous. The other thing which is quite important about loops is relatively speaking, we'll see shortly that Rather than having an antenna operating at half a wavelength above the ground, ideally, you can now op have a loop running half, half a diameter of the loop off the ground. So in other words, having a loop six foot off the ground gives you performance which, when you use it liberally, gives you comparable performance to an antenna at height. So the other thing which was quite important is I like to operate single operator multiple radio. So I wanted to have something which was high Q and good for a multi TX environment. Loops, excellent for that. So now that I've given you that rundown, I just wanted to give you an idea of what kind of performance that I actually achieved in the last seven months. What you see on the screen in green is everything that is confirmed. Those are all QSOs that have been confirmed in the last seven months. All right, that's transmissions made and receptions reports received by QSLs, EQSLs, or lot Ws or uh, ORSs. Now, the only area that I've really had struggled with has been Africa. I've been using, this has predominantly been FT8. Um, I, don't, I think it's partially down to the fact that I'm firing east-west and there's not a lot of activity in Africa. But other than that, I think by all accounts, 11,000 QSOs, 8,100 confirmations, 172 countries worked in a period of six, six months, seven months, is not bad. So clearly, it's a little bit more than a radiating dummy load. It's a dummy load that receives. So just a quick highlight. 154 countries have confirmed. 39 of the 40 CQ zones have been confirmed. I've got 788 band slots confirmed. Uh, I've worked all of the US states, and 500 plus counties worked. It, this is all in about six and a half months. Um, I'm 18 countries short of DXCC on 80 meters. So in other words, as we get into the winter months and I have some holiday and I can work the wee hours of the morning because it's hard to go to work without going to sleep, I should be able to get to five band DXCC with the mag loop. So I'm fairly confident when I say you can chase DX and work, work 150 plus countries using loops. So, when it comes to antennas, at the end of the day, like most things in life, antennas are a compromise. You've got size in terms of wavelength, you've got the efficiency of the antenna system, and you've got bandwidth. You get to choose two. Magnetic loops, certainly transmitting magnetic loops, they're small relative to the bandwidth, so relative to the wavelength, and they tend to be efficient if they're well designed and well built. So therefore the bandwidth is narrow, therefore they have a high Q. So, 
sure many of you know this already, but just to make sure we level set, radio waves are electromagnetic. There's an electric field, an E field, which uh, at 90 degrees from that you have the magnetic field. A radio wave will resonate an electrical dipole or regular antenna by receiving the electrical field portion and a small current is then transduced into the antenna and the receiver amplifies it and converts it into audio. A magnetic loop works differently in that it transduces the magnetic portion of the radio wave in the near field and it is basically a tuned circuit, an LC tuned circuit. Now, essentially the magnetic loop can be analyzed as coupling directly to the magnetic field, opposite to the principle of the Hertzian dipole, which couples directly to the electric field, which itself is then coupled to the electromagnetic field in the far field through the application of Maxwell's equations. I did promise we wouldn't get into the theory, so I'm going to park it there and then move on to something which many of you might have seen. I appreciate we've got three monitors and I didn't think that through, so my laser pointer is probably going to be interesting. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, I will then probably just virtually point to them. The end of the, effectively, being a resonance circuit using an oversized inductor being the main loop, you then have a variable capacitor that's typically opposite the feed point. Now there are multiple ways that you can feed a loop. You can have the coupling loop, which is a smaller loop, typically a fifth of the size of the main loop. A gamma match, a twisted gamma match, or ferrite cores used as a transformative coupling. For most of the loops that I've worked with and experimented with, as a tip, I would suggest you go with the transformative coupling, the ferrite cores. It's just the easiest for you to build, construct, mechanically put in place, and then create a good match. Once you get a good experience, then you can look to use one of the gamma matches or twisted gamma matches. More on that in a bit. Now, just going back, as it's a tuned circuit, you use the variable capacitor. Let me just open this. It has a a new old stock Russian or Soviet era vacuum vari variable capacitor with this little passport capacitor and you can vary the capacitance by turning the shaft. So now you can vary the capacitance therefore bringing the loop into resonance on different frequencies. The thing to bear in mind is a little movement can be a big change in frequency so we then want to use things like stepper motors or a very steady hand to turn, which we'll get to. Now, some of the defining characteristics is that we use this variable capacitor to tune the loop for resonance. Now, as this loop has a very narrow bandwidth, i.e. very high Q, every time you want to change frequency or band, every 20 kilohertz, you're going to want to retune, definitely. The other thing to bear in mind is you've got extremely high circulating currents in the loop. And you can have very high voltages across the capacitor in the loop. And this will, will go into the details to what this means for you when constructing. As I alluded to earlier, if you've got a, a loop in the attic or in the garden and it comes to winter, you don't want to be running outside every time you want to change frequency or running up a ladder into the attic. So you do want to have some way of remotely tuning the loop, which we'll get into a little bit as well. Again, as I mentioned, using a stepper motor mechanism. Now, it would be remiss of me not to put the warning out that the volts that jolt and the mills that kills, high current, high voltages <coughs> circulating, you definitely want these loops out of reach of little hands and interested neighbors and, and visitors to your garden if you're operating. Just to put it into perspective, if you're using a 100 watt transceiver, you could be generating over 10,000 volts across the capacitor. Anything up to 70 amps of circulating current, which we'll get into in a little bit. So which brings me to why would we want to use a vacuum variable capacitor rather than a high voltage air butterfly? Simply put, I haven't seen it. Uh, high voltage air butterflies going above much, much more than 7.5 kV. Um, whereas if I look at the Jennings capacitors or the Soviet era, where they are nominally rated at 10 kV, you can comfortably put 15, 16 kV through those without the magic smoke coming out of it. 
Now, the key thing here, as we'll see, is the, the current, I uh, promise not to use the laser pointer in there, is he's using it. So, um, the circulating current we do need to worry about because that is what can cause arcing the voltage. Has anybody ever seen pitting on a capacitor? Yeah? So you know what I'm talking about. So in terms of the capacitors, in terms of the tips for you, the ubiquitous online flea market auction site will have these available. Um, I would recommend the KP14s. They generally sell for under 100 pounds. If you're looking at the uh, KP14 7.5 to 350 puff or 10 to 500 puff. If you're looking at the 5 to 100 puff, about 50 quid on, on Fleabay. If you want to build your own capacitors, there are a number of options to you, but this then becomes a challenge if you want to remotely tune, unless maybe you're using a syringe and some sort of hydraulic, hydraulic mechanism. But that's an awful long run you're going to have to run. Nevertheless, if you want to experiment by using uh, coax stubs or creating plates or a trombone out of copper, you're welcome to do so. I do, however, recommend if you want to run UK QRO, get yourself a vacuum variable capacitor to avoid anything melting. In terms of feeding loops, as mentioned earlier, there's a couple of coupling mechanisms that you have available. We have the uh, gamma match, twisted gamma match, the coupling loop, and the transformative coupling. There's a really, really good source that you should, I would recommend you reading. That's written by Lee Turner, VK5LT, VK5KLT rather. The link is included in the presentation. I would encourage you to have a look at that. The easiest way to get on the air using a loop would be to use FT240 toroids. FT240 is really FT being ferrite toroid, 2.4 inches, type 43 mixture. If you want to use that for 160 through 20 meters, that works well. Uh, it will work well for 30 through 10, but just the number of windings you require on the transformative coupling changes. And just in terms of ranges, the type 61 is recommended for 30 through 10 meters. Again, this is really easy for you to get a, a good, a really good match for your loop, rather than have to worry about distances, lengths of wires, and then the mechanical attachment to the outer loop. I do mention that because you'll get it together, then a strong wind will blow, and then something moves, and then your loop's not quite working the way you'd anticipated. Whereas if you've got ferrite cores directly onto a copper pipe, Nice and snug, easy peasy. So, a couple of things to bear in mind here is that you really do want to maximize the area inside of the loop. So, the easiest loop construction is a square loop. A couple of reasons for that, you minimize the number of joints you're making if you're using copper pipes. So, if you've got um, four 1.25 meter lengths, five meter loop, you're going to have an elbow on each corner, that's two connections, and then you're going to have no doubt some sort of elbow to connect the capacitor. So you're going to have a minimum of 10 connections, if not 12 or more connections, that you're going to have to make. And you want to reduce the number of connections where possible, because every time you have a connection, you have the possibility of introducing resistance. So ideally you want a circular loop. Now unless you're going to bend a piece of copper piping, which in and of itself is fun and challenging to build a jig for that. Or you make a square loop or an octagonal loop. I've had phenomenal performance from octagonal loops, despite the number of connections made. If you make the connections well, no issues. Square, loop, square loops also work pretty well, which we'll go into the performance of them shortly. Now, I would recommend mounting them vertically when you're in proximity to the ground. If you happen to be on the top of a, a high-rise you know, uh, apartment complex, you can mount them uh, horizontally. Again, I'm going to repeat it. You do want to choose capacitors that have the highest nominal voltage and current rating that you can get. With one caveat, if you go buy the biggest, baddest capacitor you find on the ubiquitous sites, they tend to be the size of a golf ball. Not a golf ball, a rugby ball. So that makes its own mounting challenges. So you've got to bear in mind the mechanical size, physical size of these capacitors. KP14s will, will serve you well there. Now, in terms of the, the material I would recommend you use 
when building a loop. I would recommend Heliax, seven eighths of an inch, it's really easy. You can get a nice round loop out of that. You can comfortably build a loop if you were in the States or one of the countries where you can turn the dials to 11, put two kilowatts through that without any, anything melting. In the UK, we'll quite comfortably handle 400 watts. Or 28 millimeter copper. Now, the reason I recommend 28 millimeter copper rather than 22 millimeter copper is 28 millimeter copper is self-supporting if you're gonna build a large loop. And a FT240 a ferrite core fits really snugly around it. There is a performance implication if you use thin coax versus 28 mil copper. The greater the diameter of whatever the material you're using, the greater performance you're going to experience. The other thing to bear in mind is if you were going to build a loop out of 54 millimeter copper, yay, that's, that's going to work very well for you. But those fittings are going to cost you a fortune and the copper is going to cost you a fortune. So you've got to balance. Again, everything's a compromise. So 28 mils tends to be the best bang for buck and combination of performance. Couldn't resist this. Resistance is futile. <laughs> it really is. Uh, there is a link in there if you've never done any soldering of copper pipes. I would recommend uh, propane up until 28 millimeters. Anything from 28 millimeters and above, I'd use MAP. The trick is to make sure your connection's all clean. So here is my I'm good at many things, mechanically not so much. So bear in mind, uh, forgive some of the uh, jagged edges on various things. So what I've done here is, again, we've got three projectors, but if you cast your eyes to the center screen where I'm pointing the red pointer, try to get out of the way, over here we'll see what I've done is I've taken a piece of 28 mil copper piping and I've flattened it and bent it to create a bracket to minimize the number of connections I have. And then I have a bracelet that goes around the capacitor. And then I have a piece of kitchen cutting board, which I use then to mount my uh, stepper motor. Now the thing I really need to point out to you here is that where the coupling to the capacitor is, that's RF hot. So if you're ever trying to tune your, tune your radio, key down and you want to turn, well, you're in for a surprise. <laughs> and preferably you're not keyed down at 100 watts. <coughs> so make sure you've got some sort of insulator there, all right? I like to go with about 10 centimeters. You never know if you've got 10,000 plus volts circulating. I wanna make sure I've got more than enough space so there's no arcing from the capacitor into the stepper motor, back into the control cable, back into my controller. So in terms of some ideas, so this is a four meter, ooh, this is an older deck, this is a big M. This is a four meter circumference octagonal loop sitting in my attic. It's good for 17 through 40 meters. And um, you'll see a gray cable here, which is my stepper motor controller cable. And we'll get into more detail about that later. But essentially you can hide the loop in your attic. If you're gonna operate QRO from your attic, well, Things in your house might not like it so much, but um, it will work. But certainly from a receive standpoint, it works great. Here's an example of a very large loop that I built. I wanted to experiment with very large loops for 160 and 80 meter coverage. Based on the fact that I was only using a 500 puff capacitor, this covers only uh, 80 through 40 meters. But I'll show you shortly the kind of performance I was getting from this very large loop. People tend to think of loops being small small transmitting loop <coughs> antennas. I like to think of magnetic loop antennas that is designed for performance, right? Because I'm trying to get around local interference, trying to get around the fact that I can't mount something 150 meters off the ground or 150 foot off the ground. You can build smaller ones, but I'll show you shortly what the implications are of small, building smaller loops. Smaller loops means more bigger capacitors, greater voltages, greater circulating currents. Both loops have been constructed using 1.25 meter lengths of copper piping. So by using eight sections to create the 10 meter octagonal, whereas the, uh, the loop on the right hand side, it's a dual loop. It's two five meter loops next to one another, more than a diameter apart. 
just using uh, PVC piping to separate. So I'm feeding it from the top, the capacitors at the top. And I just got a shroud because it was an experimental loop to prevent it, a little bit of weatherproofing. So just in terms of placement, we were referring to my garden <coughs> art. So my garden art is more some garden tree art. And it's, I've got to manage space for the kids to run around in the garden, keep it out of reach of little hands, have some neon bulbs which can get lit when there's RF energy so people know when it's safe to play, etc. Um, each of those lengths is 1.25 meters again. So now, how do you know if your loop's working? It's all well and good that... Um, Oh, okay. It's all well and good that you've got a loop that you've built. Now, how do you know it's going to work? You can have a QSO. You can use a reverse beacon network. You can use FT8. You can use Whisper. You can even use Web SDRs out there. You key down CQ, and you hear yourself on the Web SDR. These are the typical ways you can see if your loops are working. I like to use Whisper because that shows you from a reverse beacon network style Who's heard you? They log it to a website, and you can map your performance from day of week, time of day, etc., and compare it to stations who are nearby you. So by way of uh, examples, so the five meter loop that was on the ground, this, this, whoops, that loop, this is the performance over here. So you can see New Zealand, South America, South Africa, the US, Asia, no problem. Now, we talked about using LDF 550 coax. The reason I like LDF 550 coax is you can take it, very carefully drill the center of it out, and you can take 22 mil copper pipe, insert it, it fits snugly, and you can use that as your capacitor mounting point. That is a great tip. I recommend any of you looking to build a loop to use LDF 550. It's relatively cheaply available on eBay sorry, a ubiquitous online retailer, uh, to, to, um, to buy offcuts reasonably inexpensively. Now, as an example, what I've done here, this is a rather large loop that I built. It's a dual loop. What I've done is I've taken 22 mil copper pipes, bent it using a pipe bender to create a bracket for the capacitor on the bottom right-hand corner. Insert it into copper, solder it, then use some self-amalgamating tape just to seal the connection. So that's for a very large loop. Now, as an example of a smaller loop that I'm using for 30 through 80 meters, again, what I've done is I've used plastic piping. I've put some 32 by 32 mil wood inside the, um, the tubing just to reinforce it. Control cable to the loop. This is without the shroud for the capacitor. And that's my garden art that's making electricity, apparently. In terms of how I capture the electricity, uh, jokes aside, I use a transformative coupling. Four was probably overkill, but I had four in my stock, so I banged it on there. I use a dipole center, for those of you familiar with that, to then feed my uh, uh, the, the wire that I'm using. And the reason I do that is that because then I can wind and unwind if I'm operating on different bands. The other thing we'll get into in another time, but you will, you, if you're going to use a transformative coupling, you're going to need different numbers of windings depending on which band you're on. So if I'm operating on 80 meters, I'm going to need more windings than I will need than I'm on 40 meters, approximately double the number of windings. All right. So one thing that is often overlooked or not mentioned is you need some sort of common mode choke and some sort of stepper motor choking because when you're transmitting 400 watts into your loop, it's going to radiate. And anything that's in contact with it or nearby it's going to put some energy into it, and it's going to want to find its way back into your shack. Nothing less than 5,000 ohms of impedance. Nothing less. I don't, li oop, I don't like the idea of putting something in line because it gives you some insertion losses, so I'd rather put these rather expensive clamps that you can get around the cables. That will prevent you radiating RF out into your loops from your shack, as well as getting RF back into your shack. Those of you who've had an RF bite, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So in terms of examples, in addition to what I've done, there are guys out there who've created what they've called noodle loops. There's a loop, uh, there's a link here, where the swimming noodles that kids learn to swim with, 
They use it as a former, they take some copper cladding, they wrap the copper cladding around it, and they create a loop out of that. So an inexpensive way of getting a loop together and then using a twisted gamma match as an example, or you could use a coupling loop. More difficult to use a toroid coil for that. Rich uh, K8NDS has got what he calls his helically loaded magnetic loops. Same idea, you use the copper cladding around uh, a plastic former, and uh, there's a, a link to the side there if you want to construct something similar. He's using a gamma match to feed. Ken Franklin has built a, an array of loops, a uh, triple loop, which he's had some pretty good performance from. Again, a link to his material for your benefit. So theory, here's a formula I'd like you to remember. We're going to have a test at the end. Uh, fortunately, most of you are probably like me. There's an online calculator, a highly regarded calculator, which is Excel-based. You can download at that link. The following loop calculator link we will use now shortly, just to give an example. Uh, from Pacific Calculator online, which will help you size your loops. Essentially, it gives you a page that looks like this. You put in the size of the circumference that you're going to work to, the diameter of the material that you're using, the frequency you want to, the lowest frequency you want to operate at, and the power you're going to want to put through your loop. And then it magically puts out some numbers for you. Well, it's going to say, if you're going to use a 5-meter uh, loop with tw uh, 28 millimeter copper running at 14.175 megahertz, with 100 watts. This loop will be 92% efficient. It'll have a bandwidth of 48.9 kilohertz. It will need a tuning capacitance of 28 puff, and it will have 3,384 volts circulating through it, and uh, across the capacitor, rather, and then have a resonating cir circulating current of 8.57 amps. So this is still manageable with a air butterfly capacitor. If we now go to uh, 400 watts, you're going to need 6,700 volts across the capacitor, and it'll have a circulating current of 17 amps. So this website is going to be your friend if you're thinking about making a loop. I would highly recommend it, the Pacific Calculator website. So if I take a, 40, a loop for 40 meters based on a 4 meter circumference, so this is one tenth of a wavelength as opposed to a quarter of a wavelength, that we had on the previous slide, the numbers change significantly. The antenna efficiency drops to about 5 dB below, uh, sorry, it's 31 percent efficient, 5 dB below an isotropic antenna. Um, the antenna bandwidth drops to 4.5 kilohertz. All right, great for digital modes and CW, just on voice, but make sure you're tuned. So a tenth of a wavelength is the extreme of where I'd want to go when building a loop for voice. Okay. In terms of circulating current, we're now looking at 33 amps of circulating current and uh, just under 5,000 volts across the capacitor. Again, according to the website, it's telling me that this isn't an ideal size for the loop. All right. Now, if we take this up to 400, watt, 400 watts, we can see that we are now going to be pushing just under 10,000 volts across the capacitor. There's a few more calculations we can go through, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to do it now. But what I want to do is just talk about tuning a loop. So how do you know that the, tube, th that the loop is tuned? Or how do you tune a loop? Well, one way is you get the radio out and you tune, and you turn the capacitor, and you listen for maximum receive noise. That can take you a while if you're going in the wrong direction. The other option is to use a pan adapter. And you can see where, because it's high Q, where this thing is. And you just move backwards and forwards. The other thing is you get an antenna analyzer, one with the, preferably with a graphical display. And you just see where resonance is. Or you use a combination of all of that. So I have mentioned and I banged on about it how you know, remotely tuning a loop is the only practical way to use these loops. So we are now going to look at how do we drive this capacitor. So I've personally found out of a dozen or so loops that I've built for myself and others that these two stepper motors far and away will, will, will turn just about anything that's out there. This is a stepper motor, the one that's on the left hand side, that doesn't have a planetary gearbox. It has 0.65 newtons of holding torque, which is enough to turn any of those Soviet-era capacitors at speed. Literally, I can go from 
40 meters to 160 meters. As fast as I've finished changing band on the radio and getting back to doing something, it's tuned. It's that fast. If you use a planetary gearbox, five to one, you're probably going to have to wait for the tune for the loop to get to speed because it's going to be a fifth of the speed for the tuning. So what you what you gain in torque, you're going to lose in speed. Now there's another thing to bear in mind. You don't want to operate these things too fast because you're operating too fast, the holding torque goes down, and then the stepper motor starts skipping, which creates a problem. The other thing is we'll talk about later um, if we've got time is around slop. As you're turning in one in a given direction. When you start tuning the loop in the opposite direction, you've got slop in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, tr the shaft. And the loop tuner we're going to talk about will compensate for that. If you want to build a straightforward, simple remote tune option, you can get an Arduino, an A4988 uh, stepper motor controller, and a little rotary encoder. There's two links to projects which you can then just use, and it'll allow you to very quickly download a uh, a sketch to your Arduino and it will allow you just to turn a rotary encoder which will allow you to turn up or down and you can then write the tuning position that, you've, that has been recorded manually. Or you can build an Automagic loop tuner. And I do call it Automagic because it is a... It's fabulous. Uh, Lofty Jonasson started this project a number of years ago. I had been building my own one. I'd seen his. And frankly, what he had done was just light years ahead of what I had done. So I'd fed into some ideas into his project in order to create a multi-loop tuner and switching between different uh, antennas. But I can highly recommend this project. The, the link is there. Just in the interest of time, um, what I'm going to just do is give you an overview of what this thing does. Essentially, what it does is it takes the frequency that your radio is on via CAT or CIV and any modern transceiver and you store tuning solutions. And based on the tuning solutions you have, as you track your VFO, it's automatically going to tune the loop to those tuning solutions. By having a, um, a tandem coupler, you can even press a little button, because you now set the upper and lower bounds for the tuning solutions of your loop. And you can now do SWR-based tuning. So literally click a button, SWR tune. It will sweep right, sweep left, and then recall the lowest dip. Right? Now there's one little thing that sometimes can catch you out, and that is if it's freezing outside and then it's 20 degrees Celsius the next day, the metal in the loop can contract and can expand, and that affects the capacitance and inductance of the loop which will affect the tuning that is required. Actually, it will affect the capacitance. So we then have to recalibrate the loop. So by doing one SWR tuning cycle, we hit a calibrate button. All previous tuning solutions you had in place are, still, are now still valid because the correct offset's been applied. Happy to go into that more detail, but in the interest of time, I will move on. So basics. What we'll do if we take, as I mentioned, the upper and lower bounds of, let's say, a loop for 20 meters, is store something below the band edge, something above the band edge, as the end stops, if you will. We do not want to pass that point. Because you can imagine, if you've got a capacitor, you don't want to turn beyond the physical limit of the capacitor in either direction. So we can create what's called a soft end stop, or we can use micro switches to make a hard end stop. Because the last thing will happen is your stepper motor doesn't know that it's gone too far. And then you're back on that website buying another one. So you will add as many memories, tuning solutions, as you desire. But effectively, you only need, an, let's say, four, tuning so four points between 14 megs and 14.25. And it will then extrapolate, or rather interpolate, the next stepper positions. All right, so if you've got multiple radios and you've got multiple loops, this particular project now has the possibility of controlling multiple loops and being fed by multiple radios. And what I've done, for example, is 
anything below two megahertz goes to one loop. Anything between two and four megahertz goes to another loop. And anything between above six megahertz goes somewhere else. And it automatically switches between my loops. So I can have a continuous range of coverage on the HF band. Right? I then have, I might be in an ICOM mood. I might be in a Kenwood mood. I might be in an Elecroft mood. I might be in a, uh, Ele yeah, I can't remember which I said, Elecroft mood. So you know, I can switch between radios. Now what I've done, if you're running with linear amplifiers, is you do not want to be running a tuning cycle with your linear when it's operational. Because that magic smoke will come out of your linear, or you will melt something, and it will be expensive. So you want to have, where you see the, one, where you see the one, two, three, four on the screen, that is my linear keying intercept. So I put the PTT from the radio goes in there, and then goes out to the linear. So when I'm in a tuning cycle, I make sure there's no PTT sent to the linear. Right? No magic smoke will come out. I then use DINs, DIN connectors, to go drive I've got three loops. This controller will control three different loops. And my linear happens to have uh, one for RS-232 and one for TTL uh, type of radios. So right-hand side is typically my ICOM radios. Left-hand side is Flex and Elecroft. So the EKF is uh, Elecroft, Kenwood, and Flex. I then have an 8-pin DIN if I want to control relays for external re switching of anything in terms of windings for my couplings or feed matching that I need to do. So, in terms of time, I seem to be bang on. What I'd like to do is just talk to you about some further reading that you can do. <coughs> so I mentioned the Lee Turner VK5LT that's well worth reading. Frank Dorenberg has done some, sorry, Dorenberg has done some great write-ups as well. Uh, it's a really good source for building loops. Um, likewise, what I want to do is, in terms of Whisper, if you want to know how to get on the air with Whisper, uh, I could well worth recommend recommending downloading the Whisper software and using WhisperNet. In terms of the loop design calculator, I strongly recommend the Pacific Calculator Loop calculator that I mentioned, as well as the AA5TB Excel spreadsheet if you want to get into the details. At this point, what I'm going to do is hand over to any questions and if you've got any questions yeah um, Chris G4 KWH you mentioned Chris uh, G4 KWH uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, loops reduce ambient noise you didn't say how much it reduces the signal. So that's a great question. And my only comeback at this point is, if I can't hear you, I can't work you. So even if I receive you with a lower signal, I can still work you. But in terms of re reduction, um, I don't, have, I don't have a straight answer for you right now, other than to say if I look at my, my logs and the folks who are in my neighborhood using antennas, what I'm receiving versus what they're receiving and their signal strength reports that they're posting. So, I'll Can I give you an answer? Yeah, sure. Having built 15 or more of these aerials in different materials, um, the material size makes little difference. Uh, I've used 22 mil, uh, 15 mil coaxial cable and if it's um, a round loop it's very easy to make. But compared with a conventional aerial then it certain a loop does reduce considerably the noise but it reduces the signal by the same amount. So it means the signal to noise ratio is about the same. Uh, 
Here we go. Yeah, Nigel GW zero R W. Um, I think we anything with antennas. It's called antenna theory for a reason. My experience has always been with a with a magnetic loop that it uh, in my QGH the signal to noise has been significantly improved. And yes, the signal strength is weaker, but it's similar to having a beverage. You can hear stuff on it that you just wouldn't hear otherwise. So I think ev every QGH is probably different. I think that's a key point. Is that I'm I'm for not for one minute am I saying that a magnetic loop antenna is better than any other antenna system at all about what can I get away with in my QTH in terms of size, space, the interference that I've got going around me and the height above ground that I can mount the antenna and living in a residential estate with I can't let's say 50, 60 homes within 160 meters of me uh, I want to do whatever I can to uh, receive signals because putting a signal out I've got no issue with but I do want to catch up with the offline to understand the signal to noise ratio that you're talking about because that's not been my experience. Any other questions? Uh, Martin Satch, G8KDF. Um, the experience with uh, magnetic loops is that they, because they're coupling into the magnetic field, they're coupling into the near magnetic field mm -hmm. um, and so they'll only in be influenced by other th things in the area with near magnetic field radiation. And most fortunately, in, in a household, most is electrical field near yeah. field. So the electric near field of, of your radiation neighbors won't link into your magnetic yeah. near field of your loop. So you, that improves your signal to noise ratio. Indeed. Thank you. Yes. Very quick one with respect to noise and VDSL2. Do you find any issues with directivity turning thing around to null um, with, the, with the vertical loop? Or don't you have VDSL2 problems on 80 yeah, no, meters? No, I do, but it's a very difficult problem given the fact that all my neighbors have it as well. And no matter where I point my antenna, I'm <laughs> going to be pointing at somebody. Oops. So, so that, that's challenge number one. But challenge number two, in terms of the next things that I'm working on, at the moment I'm working on co-phasing loops and co-phasing a loop with a long wire so that I can subtract noise in the near field because that's what I'm finding to the signal to noise ratio question, if I can co-phase and subtract the local noise that I'm receiving, I can get a better signal to noise ratio. So I think that will be the trick to answer your problem. Uh, Keith G3TTC, I wonder if you've seen um, the, um, there's a European manufacturer who does big uh, uh, air spaced capacity, in yes. fact he does a whole Sarah loop. Sarah Menzoni I believe. Yes. Is it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, the capacitor is a huge, uh, mechanically well constructed airspace air capacitor. Yeah. Uh, that will set you back. Uh, what your bank manager will have a chat with you. Thirteen hundred pounds. Thirteen hundred pounds. <laughs> Whereas if you go down to uh, your local purveyor of copper piping or the ubiquitous online site for getting Heliax, you can build something similar. Obviously, if you want to go in and buy something off the shelf, that is a, that's an impressive. That is the Ferrari, if you will, of, uh, of loops. Here we go. So one here and one there, and then we probably need to... Uh, two, two points. Um, do you know the relationship between the height of a magnetic loop and low field uh, radiation effectiveness? And is it worth taking a poll of people who've had uh, different experiences on signals? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take a poll and then give you my view. So anybody have uh, an opinion? Higher the better for a loop? Lower the better? No comment. Lower the better? No, I've got a comment. A, a comment. I think, I think the comment really is that maybe two loop diameters up is probably optimum. I think if you go much lower than that, you start to get ground losses. If you go higher than that, the main benefit is you may be getting up above other buildings that are screening it. But um, yeah, maybe two, two loop, loop diameters is what my research showed when I was writing a book about it. So, there we go. so I, I absolutely agree with you there. Um, I found that a diameter to two diameters is the sweet spot for loop placement. Um, by and large, if you're living in a residential area, you've got to worry about going through things. 
and having line of sight to the horizon. So I've been off to Ditcot, the Ridgeway, put a loop up there. First three contacts were Tasmania, Bob in um, the Falklands. First three contacts, I didn't have to worry about pileups. It was amazing, talking about 25 to 50 watts of power. Now, when I'm working from home, just being able to be heard because the coupling to the environment and all my other antennas and all the other metal and all the other bits in the environment, this is what you've got to worry about. So height, it's not, it's a bit of a, this is where it becomes a dark art versus the formulas that you're going to use to find usage. What I'm getting out of the loops at my place and what you're going to get at your place, depending on what's in your environment, will change. I'm probably using the next door neighbor's metal fence as part of my antenna system for all I know. I'm sorry, we, we are actually going to have to wrap up, but you catch Raoul afterwards, by all means. Raoul, thank you very much indeed. I, I'm sure that was appreciated. There's a lot of interest here. I, I think there could have been a whole lot more questions, but uh, we, we do have to no move problem. on. I am uh, available for questions now and later, and uh, yeah, by email as well. You have got his email. You're only here today, I think, aren't you? Yeah. But uh, let, let's thank Raoul in the usual way. Thank you.